pleasure to announce, to announce Natalia from University of Minnesota, uh, who will speak about this order and perhaps spin liquids. Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon to everybody. And let me continue uh, saying that it's a uh, great pleasure to be here. And thanks for organizers to give me the chance to present uh, our work. And maybe as you can guess from uh, the title of my talk, I'm going to talk about the interplay of some randomness which can which exist in all the materials and some uh, quantum fluctuation which bring the system in probably some quantum disordered state. And the playground which I'm going to discuss is the uh, Kitai of spin liquid, which was very nicely introduced on the tutorial yesterday by Hanke. Okay? So with that, uh, let me start. So uh, quantum spin liquid, the definition, the most robust definition of uh, the state is a negative one. This is the state which doesn't break any uh, symmetry and does not order. So basically in the quantum spin liquid, we do have uh, intrinsic uh, disorder. And uh, this is one of the, uh, probably the prototype of the quantum spin liquid is the uh, Anderson valence bond uh, state, the sol uh, uh, resonant valence bond sol state, which was uh, proposed in 1973 uh, by uh, Anderson. So in that case, we see that the state is the superposition of uh, covering, in this case of the triangle, and that's why I'm not saying what is the model behind the state. Uh, so it's a triangle that is covered by various position of this uh, spin singlet and the state is the superposition of this uh, singlet, perhaps only nearest neighbor one, or maybe it has all possible lengths, the singlets of all possible uh, lengths. So this is what we mean by intrinsic disorder, which might happen in a quantum spin liquid. Uh, once we go to the lab or somebody is going to the lab, Hirsch goes to the lab. So, then uh, in any real material, there is uh, some randomness. And this randomness in the form of extrinsic disorder can come in all possible uh, ways. Uh, it can be some uh, impurities, it can be some defect in the lattices, it, it can be some bone disorder, so whatever it is. So, and sometimes we see that the system in which there is a lot of disorder does not order. But then the question is, is it spin liquid or not? And what happens if we take the really beautiful pure material, which is in the quantum spin liquid state, imagine that we have one, and then we put by hand some randomness in this material. So what it will do? Will it kill the quantum spin liquid state? Will it support the quantum spin liquid? What will happen? So and basically that is what we are going uh, to discuss today. Um, okay, so, my playground is a uh, guitar spin liquid, and I will tell you later how we can apply this playground to some uh, real materials. And very, very briefly, just to set the notation. So this is this Hamiltonian. We have a honeycomb two-dimensional lattice, and on each bond, only one component of spin is interacting. While people was so interesting at this model because it's exactly solvable, and in his seminal paper, Alexei Kitayev showed us that uh, we can find this beautiful exact solution by representing each uh, spin degrees of freedom with the help of uh, Majoran experiments. And it's also clear even from the classical perspective that it's very difficult to satisfy all the bonds, that it will be this manifold of the degenerate state from which we can construct this uh, superposition, which will be at the end, the quantum spin liquid, which is not a product state, but should be written as a superposition. So this is my kind of very brief introduction to uh, quantum spin liquid. But now I want to discuss uh, some uh, characteristic of this guitar spin liquid, and that the easiest can be done through the excitations. So, and this is from the Tommy paper. I have reference, but it's not seen now. So. Once again, if we try to understand this quantum spin liquid state in terms of the spin, it's very complicated. Using this uh, Majorana representation from uh, Kitaev, we now can see what are these uh, fluxes, and fluxes are the spin, uh, spin flip uh, fractionalized into 
uh, fluxes, which are static and gap excitation, and Majorana fermions, which are the dispersive mode. So in this mode, we do have a uh, fractionalized excitation, and that is the means how we can actually study this, uh, the property of this uh, spin liquid state. And what is also important, and for later it will be important, that uh, if we flip one spin, then we will create uh, two fluxes on the nearby uh, plaquettes. And another thing what I will need uh, for my later discussion is uh, how I will characterize this excitation. So uh, basically, once again, since I'm going to discuss uh, disorder, uh, let me first say when I'm going to high temperature, and I will show another plot for this, then despite the fact that these are gap and static fluxes, then above certain temperature, which we'll call flux gap, uh, I will go to the random flux sector. But at the zero temperature, uh, Leap theorem tell us that the system in the zero flux sector, meaning that all these plaquette operator, uh, which are conserved quantity and the, which are the reason why the model is exactly solvable, has eigenvalue one. And therefore, in this sector, we can discuss the fermionic excitation. What is plot here is the density of states for the Majorana fermions in this zero flux sector. So if I'm talking about fermionic excitation, I'm talking about excitation inside the same flux sector, but I can also consider going from one flux sector to another flux sector, and then I can define what is the flux gap. So if I put the energy scale on the vertical axis here, so, and then that would be the energies, the fermionic energies uh, in different flux sectors, I can define uh, what is the fermionic gap like from the ground state to another, or what is the energy of the fermionic excitation? So if I have time reversal, uh, if I'm inside, uh, um, this, this is basically uh, the Kitaev triangle. So if all my couplings on X, Y, and Z bonds are uh, equal to each other or almost equal to each other. So if I'm in this part of the parameter space, then I have a gapless fermionic uh, spin liquid, but, then I can also define, so I go from one sector to another and my flux gap can be either very small or very large. So I will use this terminology, fermionic excitations and flux gap later on. So I just wanted to introduce this notation. And then, as I said, uh, uh, fractionalization differ uh, at zero temperature and at finite temperature. So if we are at very low temperature because flux excitations are gap, then there is uh, at low temperature, the excitations are mostly these Majorana fermions and the situation is very close to uh, the graphene ph physics. And then at the temperature around 10% uh, of uh, the Kitaev interaction, uh, I have a crossover to the, um, uh, to the phase in which uh, I have a random fluxes uh, and then I still have some, in, dip, in this random flux of sector, I have this uh, Majorana fermions. And then of course, there is, uh, once all the fractionalized excitations are excited, then at the energy scale, which is my TH, which is of the order of Kitaev interaction, then finally I'm going to conventional paramagnetic state. And then there is no sense anymore, at this temperature, there is no sense anymore to talk about the fractionalized excitations. And uh, that was all the theory at the beginning. And then once again, I'm not going to discuss it in detail, but starting from 2009, from the paper of Jacqueli and Holiulin, where they told us a recipe how, uh, how to make these materials, this field become very active. It has both experimental part and theory and people, uh, it's become really the field, which maybe one can call Kitaev uh, material. And once again, what is the microscopic mechanism? You need a spin orbit coupling in order to have Kitaev interaction. It, it, there are also other non Kitaev interaction. And once again, in the tutorial yesterday, Hanke discussed this in detail. So what I want to tell with this, that we do have material. So after this uh, 13 years, basically the list of material is very long and uh, Crystal growers are telling us often, aha, we have a new materials which might be a Kitaev candidate material. At the beginning, so the study started with the sodium uh, and lithium iridate materials. And then of course this alpha ruthenium chloride, which 
uh, is the most studied uh, guitar of materials. So all these materials order at low enough temperature. They order because of this non kitaev residual interaction, which are probably smaller than kitaev interaction. And that's why we are calling the kitaev materials are materials in which kitaev interactions are the dominant interaction. But you can see from this plot, from the review of uh, Hide Takagi and others, that in all these materials except one, and this is the last one I'm going to talk in more details about, thermodynamic quantities show some. Uh, transition present and basically the low temperature phase is um, is magnetically ordered uh, with that people start trying to see how to kill this residual interaction and how probably uh, find the true ketyl spin liquid with no long range order and uh, then there is a, another list of materials uh, and this is once again the second generation of Kitaev material. This idea to call first and the second generation is taken from this uh, paper of uh, Simon Traps. So, this second generation of Kitaev materials are more disordered. So, it's clearly there is a disorder there. And at least we can say for sure about this hydrogen intercalated lithium iridate that this material does not order down to very low temperature. So, it does have disorder because this position of this hydrogen atom. They are in between the layers, so it's not in this honey complaints, but in between, but their positions are not at all uh, well defined, so there is certain disorder. And people from the beginning understood that this, the absence of the long range order is related to uh, this quench uh, disorder. And then the question is it just disordered magnet or it is a spin leak? Okay? And once again, so this is the material of interest. So in short, this material does not uh, order at least down to 0 0.05 Kelvin, but it also have some divergence specific heat at the low temperature, which actually tell us that there is some pile up of low energy states. And once the magnetic field is applied to this material, uh, in this case, it's applied along a one 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 direction. So this upturn of this uh, uh, the suppression of this upturn in the uh, lower temperature, uh, this upturn is suppressed very, very quickly with very small uh, magnetic field. And in addition, there is probably some scaling behavior. So uh, that was very interesting data. And uh, many people look to the disorder in this particular material, trying to answer to the question, is this a Kitaev uh, spin liquid? But I think in all these lists, and maybe I miss some work, uh, works, I'm sorry in that case. So the people ask the question, starting from the earlier work of John Jolkett uh, group, uh, what disorder does for the Kitaev spin liquid behavior? Okay, so, and that uh, we also look to that. So basically let me tell about our contribution. What I'm going to talk today, the driving force uh, behind this, especially numerical calculation is of my student, Ben Han Kao, who is in the University of Minnesota and absolutely bright guy. Okay, so let me first say how we describe disorder in the Kitaev spin liquid. So this is the pure model. So basically uh, you have here uh, different colors which correspond to X, Y, and Z type of the bond. And as I said, if you go above certain temperature, then you have a soup of different flux configuration. In the pure Kitaev model, they are still uh, static. And uh, basically one of these configuration is shown here. So the thermal disorder is a particular characteristic of the Kitaev spin liquid. But in addition to that, we can engineer different types of disorder. For example, we can look to the uh, bond disorder. So some bonds here, shown in the zero flux can be weaker or stronger than the remaining boards, but we can also introduce a certain number of the vacancies or quasi vacancies. And in that case, there will be a certain density of the sites, which would be either completely decoupled from the rest or will be very, very weakly coupled. And in that case, we talk about not vacancies, but quasi vacancies. And at the end of my talk, if I have time, I will also talk about the strong disorder. So, and what kind of effects we are going to look at? Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, in this uh, Kitaev uh, spin liquid, the uh, 
concept of fractionalization actually bring together different ideas of uh, Anderson. So we can look for uh, Anderson localization in the Majorana fermions. And basically that comes together with the idea of the state, which cannot be written as a product state, but we can also uh, look to the leaf sheet sales. So this all this kind of localization phenomena can be studied in the Kitarski liquid. And also if we're looking to the uh, strong disorder, probably we can look to some critical uh, phases and some universal uh, behavior. And of course, disorder can induce a particular uh, flux structure. Okay, so let me start with the weak disorder and compare two different type of disorder. So when we have a bone disorder and the side disorder, and you will see that in this case, uh, we have completely different behavior. So following uh, Kitaev, his original paper, I just rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the Majorana fermions, and that is a straightforward way of, of doing. And this is just the Kitaev model. And the second term is the way how we can perturbatively describe the effect of magnetic field, which break time reversal. And I will have for the students here, I just have next slide to explain how to obtain this term. But basically uh, the disorder is introduced here in the model so now we have this JIJ, which depends on the bond. And with that, we can uh, mimic any type of disorder which we want. We can either have a binary bond disorder, or we can also do um, some uniform uh, bond disorder when the bond is uh, kind of distributed. And we can also divide all the sites into sites which are, uh, are not connected to the vacancy and those which are connected to the vacancy and basically put his uh, here this interaction J prime, which for vacancy is simply zero and for quasi vacancy is significantly smaller than J. So this is just one slide how uh, this free spin interaction uh, turns is appearing in the Kitaev model. So you start with magnetic field, which is in this case in a one, one, one uh, direction. And then you treat that this H X is small compared to the Kitaev interaction, but uh, what is more important that it's small compared to the flux uh, gap, the energy which calls to create fluxes in the lattice. And then what you do, you just apply this term one after another, each spin flip introduce two fluxes. So if I apply sigma X here, then sigma Y here, and then sigma Z here, then I'm going from the zero flux back to the zero flux, so, and this is basically the leading term in this perturbation, what I have here in terms of the Majorana fermions, now I have a second neighbor hopping and this model now with the presence of Kappa look very much like how they model. What it does for, so it doesn't change the flux sector. If we start from the zero flux sector, we remain in the zero flux sector. If we start for a particular Weizen crystal, so a particular flux configuration, we still remain in this flux configuration, but what it does for my runner fermions in the zero flux sector, for example, just open the gap, okay? So we will use it later. So I just want to show how it get. So the problem is uh, now, once we have this disorder, we uh, cannot, uh, momentum is not any more good quantum number because our translational symmetry is broken. And therefore we should do all the, uh, diagonalization, finding all the eigen energies uh, at a finite size system. Luckily, it's, it's just a hopping Hamiltonian, it's not so difficult, and we can go to a rather big system, and basically uh, we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian in the real space using a uh, single value decomposition. So now uh, we can rewrite this diagonal Hamiltonian in terms of the complex fermion, but here n is not the uh, momentum, but it's simply all this eigen energy in a given flux sector, okay? So uh, now how we start the disorder, okay? So basically, uh, let me start uh, with the uh, bond disorder. So, and in this case, as I said, I can look to a certain number of bonds, which here is written by rho. So this is like a binary disorder. And on a certain density of bonds, I can, either put J prime, which is smaller than J. And in this case, I dope my system with the weak bonds or with the stronger uh, bonds like J equal two, where all the rest bonds is uh, equal to one. 
So what is plotted here is the density of states. And uh, on the background, you always with the dash line, you see uh, the density of states for the pure Kitaev model. And you can see that in principle, at least by looking to the density of states, okay, so what is depopulated? The states at the Van Hoek singularity is depopulated and somewhat distributed in the energy. So if I have this strong bond, then I have more uh, uh, state at the higher energy. But overall, uh, one can say that if the disorder is pretty weak, then this modification of the state is not that strong. Okay, so this is just the density of states and the blue color here means that I compute everything in the uh, flux, zero flux sector. So this is reasonable at temperature below the flux gap. I can also compare for the uh, bond disorder, this for the uh, random flux. So when I go to the temperature above this uh, energy scale, and I consider once again that the probability for each plaquette to have either WP equal to one or minus one are equal, then I call this a, a random flux. And then I can see that all these features in this random flux goes away, okay? So the reason why I do not compare it with any other kind of flux configuration, only zero flux or random flux, because once you have a bond disorder locally, your flux gap can be very small. And basically the transition from uh, zero flux to random flux is happening pretty uh, fast. But that only tell me about the state. It doesn't tell me about the wave function, are they localized or not localized. So, and for that, we can, um, we can introduce another uh, quantity which can illustrate the localization. And that's usually done with the help of uh, inverse participation ratio, this Pn, uh, Pn, is computed for each eigenmode n, and here i is the summation over set. So this inverse participation ratio, if we have a delocalized mode, then we will have a contribution, a small contribution here from many, many different sites. Then you will see that this Pn will scale as a one over n because n many sites are, are contributing where n scales with the system size. And that would be very small. However, if we do have a localized mode, then this Pn would be larger. So if we have just one state, it would be just Pn would be equal to one, or in any case, that would be significantly larger value kind of, of order of one. And here, this IPN uh, inverse participation ratio everywhere is shown by red. And you can see that if we have a bone disorder, then even if we have some low energy state, low energy states remains uh, delocalized in all possible uh, cases, but we do see that this, especially when we dope with the stronger, uh, uh, stronger bonds, we see that IPR is significant on the tails, and that is in fact what is uh, called the Lifshitz tails when the states at the uh, age of the band becomes localized. Okay, so and here's just a comparison of IPR for weak bond and uh, strong bond cases. So here we have 10% of the weak bonds. And okay, so there is no Lifshitz tail, there is no localization here. However, and that is if we take, for example, one of the high energy modes from that area. So since the majority of bonds which contribute to the density of states here, they are coming from the strong bonds, which are the majority, then this mode can be easily uh, delocalized. However, if I uh, dop with a strong bond, so here it's uh, J prime equal to two. If I take the state uh, from uh, close to the edge, then this state has, they are mostly dominated by these um, bonds with the strengths uh, equal to two, but they are surrounded by the weaker bond and that leads to, delocaliza to localization. So it's kind of very intuitive way to understand why these states are more localized. And basically this is nothing else as a Lifshitz tails. Actually, so similar effect was also, they're called Lifshitz tails, but if you go back to original Anderson model about the localization, then he also mentioned this. Okay, so this is about the bone disorder. In any case, what you saw that you don't have a pile up of the low energy states in this 
case. Maybe you see some only if you consider the random uh, flux configuration. But now I want to consider the side disorder. And basically, I want to consider my vacancy. Again, here's the Hamiltonian where I divide it into parts. This is for the bulk, and this is basically for uh, the states around the vacancies. And what do I see? So around each of these vacancies, once again, this J prime is zero for the true vacancy and very small for uh, uh, the quasi vacancy. So first I have like either missing side or inside or very weakly connected side. And I have some mode which is localized on the opposite sublattice. So if the, this is A side, then on the uh, B sublattice around this side. And uh, basically, which was shown first uh, by the group of uh, John Choker uh, already in 2010, uh, if you have a vacancy, then energetically it's preferred to attach the flux to it. So that is called flux binding, the energy load if you attach uh the flux uh to the vacancy and okay it's always what you do you always introduce the flux in the pairs and in the ground state you will not be in the zero flux but you will be in the bound flux state okay so now just to have this kind of uh color coding so blue is always for flux free orange is always for random flux and green i show for the case of the uh side disorder in the form of the vacancy. Uh, so here, for example, we have the density of vacancy 2%, here's a 5%. That is the case of the true vacancy. And here is the case of the quasi vacancy when J prime is equal to just 1% of uh, J and they have 5% of the state. What you immediately see that in this case, you have a pile up of the low energy state. Moreover, these states are localized so or at least they are quasi localized and we need to understand this uh, what is this localization so again the uh, spectral weight is transferred from around uh, the uh, van hoff singularity region it's transferred both to the low energy region but also a little bit uh, so it's transferred to the low energy but you also have localization so red is always the ipr so you see that both the low energy states and the states at high energy are quite, low, are quite localized. Okay? So um, again, so this is the Lipschitz scale. And uh, once again, when we talk about this quasi-localization, you see it's not one, it's uh, large, but not one. So in fact, uh, these low energy modes are only uh, quasi-localized and they decay with the distance as one over r to the power alpha so it decays the wave function decays when you go away from the uh, vacancy okay so um in fact i can consider this uh vacancy also in the random um in the random flux so basically i do not attach the flux to a vacancy but i consider uh, the uh, random flux that's why it's in orange and then you see that in this case the vacancy still give you uh, some pile up of the low energy states, uh, but they are not localized. So basically we see that one ingredient which we need to explain this experiment, and I will come to the experiment in a moment, that the vacancy introduce a certain number of low energy states, and these low energy states will be seen in the thermodynamics. So this is the conclusion of uh, part one. And basically what I wanted to show that there are different type of disorder, side disorder, bone disorder, and also uh, thermal uh, disorder. And once again, in the Kitai quantum spin liquid, as I said before, the ideas of quantum spin liquid and the one, bo and one body uh, Anderson localization kind of intertwined uh, through the concept of spin fractionalization. And now basically, what I am uh, going to discuss, can we use these vacancies in order to explain uh, experiment uh, by Takagi when uh, lithium iridate was intercalated with hydrogen? Okay, so here's just a collection of data. I don't know, so maybe everybody saw this before. So many different type of experiment were performed and they are all reported in this, uh, in this paper. What is important that it's indeed an insulator 
and you see this NMR, there are no splitting or broadening down to the very low temperature, but also here uh, you see in, in the NMR, you also see that there is a lower energy excitation. And then once again, this particular Paolo divergence of the C over T in the specific heat and some scaling behavior in the presence of the magnetic field. Let's see how we can explain this with uh, our theory. So once again, let me consider now this 2% uh, of the vacancy. And I consider this uh, bound, uh, flux bound to the uh, vacancy. So then this is the density of states. So it's not really universal because the way how this slope is uh, starting depends on the, uh, on the density. But I can clearly see that I have uh, the corresponding upturn in the C over T. Okay. And what is uh, important, so it's just basically comparing in this inset, what is compared is how the specific heat behave in the, uh, in the uh, pure model and then how it behave in the bound flux. So what, there's some questions, so maybe you can read it to me, but let me finish just this slide. So you see that this upturn, you get both in the bound flux and in the zero flux. And once again, it's how uh, this upturn depends on the system size. And basically you can see that when you go to bigger and bigger system size, then the slope more or less saturate to, uh, you can uh, saturate to a particular value of like 0 0.5, which is very close uh, to, to the experimental result. So what is the question? Yeah, the question is, what is the physical significance of the random flux sectors at zero temperature if the ground state is in zero flux? In zero temperature, uh, there is none. So uh, in principle, you can think about the disorder, but what is happening that in the Kitaev model, we have all the flux sectors. So zero flux is the ground state and these random fluxes, these are all different configurations. These are excited states. But once you have a temperature, you can, your system is actually the soup of all these different configurations. So it's at finite temperature. In any case, we are in interested in the thermodynamics. So we need to consider what is uh, the exciting state of the model. So, um, okay. So this slide is just to show that the vacancies are kind of good because once again, flux sector is one thing and also the density of fluxes is a, a kind of the external thing which we control. But you can see that in all these three cases, green, that is the vacancy with the bound flux, zero flux and the random flux, uh, you can see that you have upturn. So the question which you need to now to answer is how to suppress this upturn. So what do you need? What are the ingredients you need to suppress this uh, pile up uh, of the low energy states in there. And here it becomes a bit tricky. So one can do a very careful numerical study. And basically you can show that when you apply magnetic field and we always remain in the exactly solvable limit. So we never say magnetic field, we mimic it with the effect of kappa. And that is this free spin interaction, which I showed you before because in that case, the model remain exactly solvable. But you can see that here is the transition. So when kappa is growing, there is a critical value of kappa where above which it's not anymore energetically preferable to attach the flux to the vacancy. So the system goes from the bound flux uh, state to the zero flux state. And now we just look uh, in this particular kind of uh, either in the bound flux state or in the zero flux state, we're now switching up kappa. And what we see, what kappa does, kappa opens the gap in the bulk of the Majorana fermions. So what we see here when we go down, so this green, once again, it's a bound flux, blue is the zero flux. What we see that the structure of the states are different in these two cases. And this difference in, the, uh, in this in-gap state, in-gap spectrum is actually responsible for, for this behavior. And I would want to de describe it in a, middle, uh, in a little bit uh, more details, but you see that when we have a bound flux, we know when the time reversal symmetry broken, then for each 
flux in the time reversible in time reversal broken phase, it would be a zero mode attach. And this, yes. Okay. And the zero mode is basically will be very important. Yes. Yeah, it's remained my run thermos. I will always have particle fault with even disorder. With even disorder. So sometimes you have this divergence of the density of the state in the type six model. I mean, in my case, my physical states are actually, I mean, it's just shown here also. So in the Kitaev model, when you're dealing with Majorana fermions, you redefine your vacuum. So in the vacuum, you uh, fill all the states with the negative energy and the excitation only with the positive energy because uh, in Majorana fermions, you have extended Hilbert space. So, but the particle hole symmetry remains all the time because Majorana fermions creation and negation Operator is the same. So, no, because sometimes with zero energy, low types of disorder problems, you get. I will just discuss, I will discuss the zero energy in the next couple of slides. Okay. So, what I wanted to say that we do see this. So, if you follow my stars, so you do see that uh, when copper is growing, I should go from one sector to another. But you also see here that the, uh, uh, so basically the idea is that. Once I have big enough kappa, so and my gap is big enough, what is responsible uh, for the behavior in a specific heat is what is the spectrum of this uh, in gap state. So if I have a bound flux, because once I have a flux, I have a zero mode, which would be broadening, and I can show it in the uh, like toy model, these states here. Uh, would still give you some upturn even when copper is growing. However, because when the copper is growing, you have to go from this picture to that picture, then you see that basically the absence of the zero mode in the zero flux sector, actually you start having some less and less state inside the gap. And the difference is once again, what are the low energy modes which we consider? So for each vacancy in the zero flux we will have something what we'll call B. This mode is like either the absence of, uh, this is the vacancy mode, which would be localized. And then we will have this uh, mode, the peripheral mode, that's the same story as in graphene. So, and this mode is only quasi localized. Once we have a flux attached to this, and this is our flux mode, then when copper is broken, then we'll have additional low energy mode. So basically, this is kind of this toy mode for explaining these in-gap modes. So again, uh, so this is basically what is written here. I already said that I have these two different vacancy. I have interaction between this low energy mode inside uh, inside um, uh, the vacancy. So I can sorry, it's not really seen. Uh, it's maybe because of that. But in any case, so this, I don't know how to remove this. Uh, okay, maybe it's uh, because here I remove everything. So maybe I should also I remove. Want to remove the... Yeah, I want to remove because otherwise. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, in any case, so what is written here? Maybe the simplest is it? Oops, no. Uh, Sorry, um, just bring it up and I will show play. Okay, so um, what I want to say that we can write the minimum mode. If the gap is large, we just write everything at the energy scale below the gap. We will write what is the interaction between these modes uh, inside the vacancy. And that is just proportional to this J prime. And that is the quantity which is, um, Basically, it's zero if it's um, if it's a true vacancy and it's very small. But I also have this coupling between this vacancy because all the vacancies are created in pairs, and this coupling is weak. It's weaker and weaker if the vacancies are further apart. So it's proportional to one over L. Okay. So and then basically, when uh, copper is uh, getting larger, what is happening? This my zero mode is depopulated. And then I have only this interaction inside, which is basically 
I have a gap, so it's very difficult to communicate in between different vacancies. So, and there is nothing to protect this zero mode and they become uh, gaps because of hybridization. The situation is very different when I have a bound flux because now I have three degrees of freedom and I need to write this interaction inside the gap for these three different modes, but this zero mode, it's hybridized, of course, a little bit with uh, another low energy mode. So it's broadened somewhat. So I do have a macroscopic number of these, uh, I have some uh, number of uh, states around zero and these states still uh, participate in the thermodynamics. So they should be seen in the thermodynamics. So in short, uh, the answer is that the fact that the specific heat C over T is suppressed when we increase kappa is be because of two things. So one is because we have a transition from the flux free sector, so sorry, from the bound flux sector to, okay, to the, uh, uh, from the bound flux sector to the uh, zero flux sector. And then once we go into this transition, then the structure in gap states changes, okay? So, and once again, we look back to experiment and we just compute this curve for different kappa and you can see that, okay, so you suppress it and then you have this behavior. So, which looks uh, very similar to what was observed uh, in the experiment and no, not really exactly because kappa of course is not the magnetic field, but assuming that kappa is proportional to H cube, we can still try explain this uh, scaling behavior. So I understand that I have only five. So basically, uh, I know that Hideta Karagi is not completely buying our theory and I don't really understand the, the reasoning, uh, but uh, I do think that this kind of vacancy of some sort of these local defects is uh, uh, actually uh, if some uh, reasonably, uh, some reasonable, uh, understanding of the experiment, okay? So we are kind of happy with that, but. Okay, so let me, I have really few minutes, but let me tell you where we were going uh, recently from that. So what I was telling before, it's all about the weak disorder. And then uh, by reading this paper from Itamar, Kim Chi, uh, Skelton and McQueen and Patrick Lee. So at the same time, they were also thinking about the same experiment and they were thinking that in fact, this kind of uh, scaling behavior in the specific heat, which was seen in the, with the magnetic field, can be understood uh, with the help of the random singlet phase. And we wanted to understand uh, this. Uh, so first, let me say that random singlet phase, that is the phase which naturally appears in the uh, 1D model, in the disordered 1D model, and they were studied uh, to death with the help of uh, a real space uh, strong disorder and realization group. But uh, basically the idea is when you do dissemination, when you get rid at each step of iteration, you get rid of high energy degrees of freedom. At, at the end, you go to the low energy phase where each side participate in the formation of the single. Uh, so, but, and basically in 1D, that can be the exact solution, okay? So, but a random singlet is not a quantum spin liquid. And if something like this is happening here, then perhaps we should not talk about the Kitaev spin liquid, but we should uh, talk about some strong disorder which leads to a formation of something which we understand in 1D and in 2D, that's very difficult to study. So, uh, with Vinhan, what we did, we tried to look to the minimum model in which we can still study the physics of, um, of the Kitaev model into D. What do we need? We need to have one of the uh, important things for exact solution. We also, we need to have this plaquette operator. And then we wanted to have something quasi 1D that we can apply this uh, strong disorder in normalization group. And for that, we just took a stripe of these uh, honeycombs. And basically in order to, uh, to employ the periodic boundary condition in this direction. So 
you need to add this additional uh, coupling here. So to some extent, this uh, stripe of the honeycomb is nothing else as this ladder, and the Kitaev model on the spin ladder is exactly solvable. You still have a plaquette operator, and plaquettes are still uh, exactly solvable. So basically, uh, what we first look, uh, and that is for the pure model, we look to the flux uh, distribution, flux gap distribution in this uh, model, uh, in the honeycomb model, and you can just plot it Jx over Jz here, Jy over Jz. So this is some sort of uh, Kitaev uh, triangle, but computed for the flux degrees of freedom. And we computed also for the ladder, and there is a certain similarity between the two. So we thought, okay, so it's difficult to study. This problem is difficult to study, but let us study the ladder. And here there are two uh, limits which we only managed to study. It's this xx limit. So here everything is in terms of jz. So in the x limit, jx and jy are equal to each other. And in the Ising limit, we consider jy very small. So these are two different uh, limits and uh, really two minutes. So what I need to say quickly is that uh, the people before us in this, in this paper, they make wonderful transformations. So there is a duality transformation which map this uh, Kitaya ladder uh, to the one dimensional chain, but in this mapping, so it's exact mapping, what you have is now your plaquette operator, this WL is inside the model. And this is already a 1D model, and this is amenable to this strong disorder randomization group analysis. And once again, skipping all the details, what I want to show is now you can, uh, in this model, in this 1D model, you can study in these two limits at least, you can study the scaling of the spin and uh, flux gap. Once again, I understand that I don't have time. Let me skip details and I have them in the conclusion. So basically what is important, there is another model, 1D model where you can study, where you can apply this very well developed SDRG approach and Basically, what you can see there that you have a spin gaps. So basically, we look to the extreme statistics to the minimal spin gap and minimal uh, flux gap. So you can see that the spin gaps and flux gap, remember my definition at the beginning of the talk, they show different type of the criticals. They show some universal behavior in some cases, but this universal behavior depends. Are you looking for the spin gaps or you're looking for the uh, flux gap? Uh, we cannot immediately extend our uh, 1D results to the 2D result, but I think we can learn something. If something non-universal is happening at really low temperatures in this 2D, perhaps we can understand it with the help of this 1D analysis. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, let's allow for a few questions, even though we're all the time. So <clears throat> the experiments then I, are reproduced by pack and C disorder, no bone disorder. This Not scaling, really, yes. I mean, uh, in order to have this uh, uh, for this experiment, you're talking about this mm. hydrogen. So you can still. Uh, Somewhat explain it with the help of the bone disorder, but for this you need to assume the random flux configuration. Mm -hmm. But if you have a random flux configuration, that means that your flux gap is very small. Then it's not clear what protect quantum spin liquid and is it really the spin liquid behavior or not. In vacancies, the gap for the fluxes for most of the plaquette is still the same flux gap, so spin liquid behavior is preserved. Let me read. Uh, okay, I just saw the. It's already disappeared. Okay, please. No, it's okay. We'll do it later. So, uh, okay. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I I came in late, so I may have missed this. But uh, do you ever uh, explore the possibility of non-ergodic phases, like glassy phases, where the dynamics are frozen? Because at least the phases that I heard about 
tended to be ergodic phases. I mean, we did not discuss dyna dynamics at all. So we only consider thermodynamics from the statical point of view, trying to explain this specific heat and so on. So to some extent, no. So Okay, but in, in principle, you could have them. In principle, you can have them. And you could have some very interesting glassy behavior Absolutely. in the system. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me read the question. I think the question was why in 1D the random singlet phase is not a quantum spin liquid because it's a product state. So basically the definition for quantum spin liquid is that it's a not product state. And here, even if you have all these different singlets, then in any case, you are writing the uh, product state, which is not a quantum spin liquid. Yeah, are there then, any but, other questions? No, that was the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's thank Natasha again.